Tonight, I'll present a variety of data, some of it very new, very new data that you can immediately consider taking back to the bedside and, and home side of your patients today. And some of the data, very old, but data that is essential, essential for us to be able to care for our patients after they leave us so that they can recover the quality of life they came to us to restore. I'd like to see my associations with industry and with government funding agencies as alignments of interest. I think we have the same goal, whether it be industry, government, or myself, and all of us to do research, and that is to improve patient care and to give patients their lives back. So I, I'd like to see them as alignments, not conflicts. The key message that I, I want to share tonight is we must take responsibility for our patients' outcomes, not just in the ICU, but we have to take responsibility for what happens after the ICU. If we aren't returning the quality of life to our patients, all the fancy technology and money we can spend in the ICU with our ECMO and our CVVH and our fancy ventilators is meaningless. Because if our patients don't go home and walk down the street again with the people they love, or hold their grandchildren again, are we creating survivors or are we creating victims? The good news, of course, is our technology and our, our fancy ventilators are working. We're reducing ICU mortality. It's decreasing across the world. It's fallen by half, most data would say, in the last 10 years alone. But then the question is, in ICU are we winning many battles, but ultimately losing the war? Is this not a Pyrrhic victory that we are winning for our patients as we fight the battle and win the battle against sepsis? Anyone know who Pyrrhus was? Pyrrhus was a Greek general who went to the aid of a Greek city in the Italian peninsula around 200 BC. And he brought 40,000 men, 50 elephants, and fought the Romans for five years, winning every battle he fought. But at the end of five years, he had to return to Greece with 5,000 men and a broke treasury, losing the war because he so depleted his forces winning all those battles. Do we not do that for our patients as well often as we deplete them? Because all those substance deaths have fallen by half. We've tripled the number of people going to rehabilitation. We've tripled the number of people going to rehabilitation. And we don't know if any of these patients or how many of these patients ever went home or how many of them even lived a year? Because we know that perhaps 40% of our deaths, 50% of our deaths within a year of ICU happen after the patient leaves us. So given this, we now need to focus on quality of life as our endpoint, not only research-wise, but clinically. We need to be thinking about this from the day they're admitted if we're going to start creating survivors and not victims in our patients. And so I will pose you a question that I want you to ponder. If your patient leaves the hospital alive, was your care successful? Of course, that's the first success we have to have, but who wants to live to be 70 like this? I hope most of you in the audience would raise your hands if I asked you that question. Or 100 like this. So quality of life versus quantity of life is a key question, and no one cares more about quality of life than people like this. And of course, you have to do more than eat right to look like this. They did a survey of Olympic athletes, Olympic powerlifters like this a number of years ago, and they asked them a simple question. You're offered a banned substance, a steroid perhaps, with two guarantees. You won't get caught and you'll win your event. How many of them took it? Only three said no and they shouldn't have been at the Olympics in the first place probably. Then they changed the question. Now you're going to win every competition for five years and then you're going to die. How many still took the supplement? More than half. This is what quality of life means to a 20-year-old. What do we think it means for our elderly ICU patient? It means that perhaps we should be putting this foremost in our thought process. If we can't return the quality of life to patients from day one and be thinking about that, are we thinking about the right things? 
So of course, what really happens to our patients after ICU? We need to ask. And people like Wes Ely at Vanderbilt University in America have asked. This is a patient named Melissa who was taken care of at Vanderbilt. Wes Ely interviewed her afterwards, and I had the honor of meeting her and her husband as well about a year ago. And she was a patient who'd had cancer, leukemia, many years ago, and went through two years of grueling chemotherapy as part of this cancer care and survived it, been in remission many years. Unfortunately, she developed ARDS not so many years ago, and she spent three weeks in the ICU with her ARDS. And 23 days later, she was discharged, not of course to home, but to a rehabilitation setting. And we as the ICU doctors applaud ourselves. We saved her life. But was she a success? And how did she feel about, what would, how did she describe her quality of life after she left the hospital? I want you to listen as Melissa talks about comparing having cancer for many, many years and all the care, the therapy that took to three weeks in the ICU and how, what it was like after. Listen closely. If you presented me with arts and cancer, leukemia, I would choose the leukemia. So our patients are telling us they'd rather have cancer than be in the ICU with us. And why is that? Is that because of the loss of their quality of life? Is this where we're losing the war? So I want you to listen to Melissa again, talk about what it was like after she left the hospital and what that experience was like. I was so weak, I could not, I could hardly lift my limbs off the bed. I could not sit up. Once they did get me in an upright position, it was absolutely terrifying. I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't walk, I couldn't stand. I, I, I had to learn how to swallow. And I remember. She had to learn how to swallow. She didn't walk for months. The weakness she experienced was amazing. And even our most fit patients, this was a professional athlete. I get many calls and emails from patients around the world asking, where are the guidelines for nutrition to help me get better because I'm not getting better. It's been many months and I'm still so weak. And this was one of those patients, Mervyn Singer referred this patient to me from the UK. And he said, you know, I used to ski marathons, 70 kilometer races. Yes, people do that kind of thing. And then I got pneumonia. And he was 49, got pneumonia, was only in the hospital a few days. Got sepsis from it, was in the ICU, but a few days, ventilated for one day. In the hospital, a total of only 10 days. Three months following discharge, he couldn't even go up the escalators of the London Underground without being short of breath, without being exhausted. He worked with a trainer, as he'd done for many years. He couldn't gain any endurance or any strength. He said leaving the ICU, or leaving the hospital even, was like jumping off a cliff. There was no one there to help. There was no one there to give him guidance. We need to change this. Our patients shouldn't be living like this. So no one is immune to this. All our patients, unfortunately, suffer after the ICU for any length of time. 60 to 80% of people will be severely disabled, like Melissa, who never returned to her work that she did before as an accountant. She's never returned to this day, and it's been many years because of what happened in the three weeks she was in the ICU. So this is exceedingly common. In fact, it's an epidemic. Why are we losing this war? Of course, we know that a patient can lose a kilogram of lean body mass a day in our ICUs. Even after major surgery, I'll, sh I'll show you later. How we expect to get our patients to survive that and function again. And we know that the hypermetabolism and catabolism persists, persists for months to years after this. Reed Vandenberg is even implying perhaps it persists for a lifetime. It changes our very genetics where we remain hypermetabolic and catabolic. And the thing is, patients gain weight sometimes, we see this, but they're not gaining muscle, they're gaining fat because they're remaining catabolic and they eat, but they don't gain strength. Why is that? What can we do? How do we start winning this war? Of course, this is going to take a combination of nutrition, rehabilitation, and perhaps even some elite sports techniques, a new one I'll tell you about tonight that one of our audience members is the champion of. 
What about after ICU and what about after hospital discharge? What are we going to do? How many calories does it take to recover? And do we already have data answering this question for us that's 70 years old? Have we known this answer since 1945? Of course, we know what was going on in the world in 1945. The world was at war. And the US realized that Europe was starving and that starvation was killing far more people than bombs and bullets were. So we had to know how much food needed to be sent to Europe and to Asia to recover the starving masses following this war. So a study was conceived to look at what it actually took to recover from starvation. They called it the Minnesota Starvation Experiment. They found 36 volunteers who didn't want to kill people. It was against their religious or personal beliefs, but they wanted to help with the effort. They wanted to help people. They volunteered to be starved under a football stadium at the University of Minnesota in the US for a year. They were fed a baseline. These are healthy 21-year-olds. They were given 3,000 calories, which is a normal baseline even to this day by the RDA, for three months to stabilize them. They then were starved with 1,800 calories and about 0.7 grams per kilo. Actually, you'll realize this is twice what we feed the ICU patient for two weeks. This starves normal people. Imagine what it does when you give half this to an ICU patient. And then they were supposed to lose a kilogram a week, which they did. It was dramatic. Everyone lost weight. The malnutrition was unbelievable, unbelievable. All the men lost interest in sex, so it had to be bad. It had to be bad. They were depressed, they were anxious, they were delirious. It sounds a lot like our ICU patients. You wonder, we say delirium's caused by drugs and lack of sleep and all those other things, but the starvation we put upon our patients in the ICU and in the hospital, we know that causes delirium in normal people. Imagine what that does to sick people. It's an unexplained, unknown cause with very little data. So they lost a lot of weight. 70 kilos down to 52 kilos within that few month period. It's about the amount of weight most ICU patients actually lose as I watch them over the years. And then the idea was, let's give them back different levels of calories to see what it takes to regain weight. It was much harder than they expected. They started with 400 to 1,200 additional calories per day, up to 3,400 calories a day, and no one gained weight. In fact, most of the men continued to lose weight, and these were not hypermetabolic or catabolic ICU patients. These were normal people. So then they went up more, up to 4,200 calories a day. And they discovered it took an average of 4,000 calories to regain weight after you'd suffered a weight loss like this. 2,000 didn't treat anybody. Didn't treat anybody, no one recovered on that. 12 men stayed for two months longer being monitored, eating whatever they wanted. They ate 5,000 to 12,000 calories to recover on their own. It took six months to two years for these men to recover from this few months of starvation. And somehow our ICU patients are supposed to leave the ICU and go back to their own lives and recover on their own? How is that possible without our help? It's led to the perhaps most important nutrition study ever done. If you haven't read it, you should, although it's 1,500 pages long, so it might take you a moment but it teaches us more than a stu most studies and it will never be repeated. So what does this teach us that we can take away? Well, it's interesting when we actually study the total energy expenditure of a recovering ICU patient, you can see these are week two numbers I have circled. It is almost exactly the same as those starving Minnesota men 70 years ago. 3,000 to 4,000 calories is the total energy requirement of a patient in recovery from ICU, and this is measured, and these are ICU patients now. It's amazing, we haven't changed much as humans in 70 years. So we need significantly more calories in our recovery phase and protein to recover. And of course, this leads to the idea of personalization, the one size doesn't fit all for sure. The personalization of nutrition that you've heard about tonight so much from all of our speakers. So of course, as patients leave the hospital, leave the ICU even, you heard they don't take it enough. Emma has taught us that. You heard it brilliantly in the last lecture. So of course, we need to be thinking about the calories and the protein being essential. And we often leave the protein out as we're hearing, because you can't build a house without bricks and you can't recover muscle without protein. 
We need to be getting to the two grams per kilo if we want our patients to recover. It's a brilliant paper by Dr. Weiss and Dr. Phillips, who's one of the world's leaders on exercise and muscle mass recovery. We know, of course, patients are anabolic resistant, or people are, as they age. It takes more protein to gain muscle as we age than when we're young. Although, of course, as you age, you don't have to lose muscle. This is a 70-year-old you're seeing. He's doing a little more than just eating to look like that, but it is not required to lose muscle as we age. But there's much to be learned from athletes who can maintain muscle mass into their 80s and 90s. I watch people in the US who ski into their 90s and have as much muscle mass as my 20-year-olds. This can be done, but it needs to be done with bolus of protein. I think the day of bolus feeding in the ICU, as Zudin Puducherry, who may still be in the audience, is studying, is coming. This is the only way to make muscle anabolic. Continuous feeding does not work. It does not do that. No athlete would ever continuously feed themselves. It doesn't work. And they would always take branch chains at night. They would always take amino acids before they went to bed. Do we tell our patients to do this? Why don't we? And of course, you have to combine this with exercise. And so we have to be better. The anabolic resistance of critical illness is a whole other world. It's severe beyond anything we've ever seen, and it probably will take more than nutrition to recover. But again, they're never going to eat enough. You've seen data all night that they're not eating enough after ICU. And so oral nutrition supplements are mandatory. And I'm going to advocate to you that a six-month minimum should be placed on every patient leaving the ICU to receive an oral nutrition supplement, because we know it's a minimum of six months even for a healthy person to recover from a starvation event and a lean body mass loss event like we put upon our patients. Nobody should be without an oral nutrition supplement for six months after ICU. It has to be that long, probably, or longer. And I'll show you why very personally in a moment. Vitamin D deficiency has to be treated. 80% of our ICU patients are vitamin D deficient. Vitamin D is essential for many of the key recovery processes our patients need to do. It's, of course, all the rage. It's in the news, and lots of regular people are vitamin D deficient as well. But it's essential to how our body's immune system functions, how it fights cancer. It's essential to cognitive function, which we know cognitive dysfunction is a huge part of ICU disability and long-term disability. And it's essential to muscle. Our muscle cannot be anabolically active without it. So clearly, we have data that reduces mortality in the ICU, even in the acute setting. But we can't ignore it in the chronic setting as well. I check it every week in my ICU patients. Even if I replete them early, they'll be deficient at three weeks every time. Every time. And I have to replete them again. So we measure routinely. We give 100,000 units a day to replete this for five days. And then we check it again in two to three weeks. And we replete it again when we need to. Copper is deficient. If you are copper deficient, you can have permanent, severe myo and neuro dysfunction. You can have weakness that lasts for a lifetime. Sounds like our ICU patients in many cases. How many of those patients actually are masquerading actually as copper deficiencies? And if that's allowed to persist in your ICU, and it's 80% of my CVVH patients that have it after five days, there's, their weakness will never go away. This can't happen under your watch. You need to be checking this. It's essential. Carnitine gets deficient too. I'm seeing 60% of my patients be carnitine deficient. You can't transport energy to the muscle without it. So we need to be personalizing our feeding and perhaps measuring a way to do that. Is there a new and better way to measure this? And can we learn from our elite athletes to teach us? Can the Tour de France athletes teach us how to take better care of ICU patients? I'm going to advocate to you that they can. There's a new technology called the muscle sound. It's an ultrasound that can measure muscle glycogen, lean body mass, and muscle quality at the bedside. I dream of a day when every dietitian will carry one of these around the hospital. Just like our physicians do, our dietitians, I said on my podcast, are the nutrition scientists of our hospital setting. That's what we need to have more of. How does this work? How does this work? Well, we know muscle glycogen is essential to muscle recovery and performance. You heard about that 49-year-old from England, Mervyn Singer's patient, who couldn't get up the escalator, likely because his muscle glycogen was low. We can actually measure that now. If you run out of glycogen, you can't, you can't exercise even for a few minutes. Glycogen depletion leads to a patient who can't be anabolic.
They'll have muscle damage as the muscle breaks down amino acids for energy. And so this is not a patient you're going to help recover. But we've never been able to measure it before. But you can't be anabolic if this is the case. What happens in the ICU? This is what an elite athlete looks like. This is a perfect muscle glycogen of 90. The dark muscle, the water follows it. This is after a marathon. It goes down to about 62. These are some examples of the muscle glycogens of various studied groups. We've published this recently. Post-soccer match is not your weekend soccer. That's a professional league. This is what critical illness looks like. They go to zero in 24 to 48 hours. This is what they look like when you ultrasound them. The muscle looks nothing like it. 70% of the first 15 people we checked had zeros, and that persisted in many of them, although it did recover in the ones who did well. But it puts great risk to the muscle. Joe Mullinger sitting in the front row generated these pictures. Now the muscle sound comes in color. This is an ultrasound probe that fits in your hand and plugs into your iPhone. Gives results in five minutes. But you can see sepsis leads to necrosis in the dark purple areas of the higher muscle glycogen, the light purple is low muscle glycogen, and the green is injury. But different critical ill patients have different amounts of injury. And then it does seven point body composition measurement as well, far more accurate than just one point as we've done in the past. So this again is the dream of our nutrition science evolving, that we can measure the effects of nutrition over time, measuring body mass over time, and actually see if our patients are recovering, see if we're actually getting what we want from the nutrition we're giving them. So there's many opportunities in the future to change the technology of what we do, to change the outcomes of our patients using these new technologies and using a variety of interventions that include nutrition and even go beyond nutrition. And if you want to read more about them, these are some examples of some of the papers we published recently looking at some of these new techniques and these new technologies. So I always get asked, I'm an anesthesiologist by training and an intensive care physician, why, why do I care so much about nutrition? And why do I care so much about what happens to patients after the ICU? I don't really see them after the ICU. Well, there's a lot of reasons I care, and there's a lot of reasons I hope you care as well. First off is, all of you, we estimate, or at least Derek Angus, who edits JAMA's critical care section estimates, all of you will be in the ICU sometime in your lifetime. In fact, 1.7 ICU admissions is the average in the US and worldwide per person, at least in much of the world. So this is something we're all going to face. And so someday this ICU patient will be you or someone you love, and you want them to recover too. Or perhaps, at one point, or at many points in my life, it was me. This is me at age 15, just out of the ICU, on TPN. At age 15, I was diagnosed with ulcerative colitis. Was in the hospital for a year on parental nutrition. Dietitians and TPN saved my life, as well as the intro nutrition I got. Over time, I had 22 more surgeries, leaving me with 160 centimeters of small bowel and an ostomy I still wear today. It's always been a part of my life. I've been in the ICU many times and had to learn how to recover and prepare for such occurrences in the future. This has missed me a few years ago with one of my sons, not the one sitting in the front row, but the middle son. This is my grandfather's house, probably the best shape of my life. Unfortunately, a month later, I ate some quinoa. Don't ever eat quinoa, never ever. Ended up in my own, I, my own emergency department with a rising lactate, bowel edema, and a bowel obstruction. Ended up having a surgeon show up who I had trained as an intern a few years before, thinking she was going to open my belly. I wasn't so excited about that. But nonetheless, they took me to the operating room. I was in the operating room for eight hours as they took down adhesions and cleared quinoa. I ended up in my own ICU with an open abdomen hours later for fear of bowel ischemia and persistent bowel edema. Spent 23 days in the hospital on TPN, much of it, thinking I would be able to feed myself. Of course, not very much succeeding, but believing so every day. I went from looking like this in July to a month later looking like this. I lost 20 kilos in 17 days. Kilogram of lean body mass loss a day doesn't seem real. Oh, it's real. This happens. This happens to the people in the best shape and the worst shape. I couldn't walk down the street a month later. 
I was too short of breath. Too short of breath. No one's immune to this. I couldn't pick up my own smallest child, who was five at the time. Four months later at Christmas, I still was too weak to pick him up. This is what the ICU does to our patients months later. So what does ICU recovery look like for me? What do I need to do to recover? Much like the Minnesota starvation patients, 4,000 calories a day and two grams of protein per day for two years it took to regain that weight. It took me two years. And I'm not a 70-year-old. Imagine the challenge for them. Again, this data is old. We've always known this. But I live it, and I have lived it many times. And I exercise five days a week, of course. That's essential to our patients' recovery as well. Tim Buckman, who's the editor-in-chief of Prudhoe Care Medicine, asked me to put down all the things I take because he said, you know, Paul, I've known you many years, and you get better so quickly after the ICU. How do you do it? And so I made a list for him. He had a friend that was having big surgery. And I realized I take about 10 or 15 things a day. And I eat like this every day. How many of our patients will know how to do this if you don't teach them? Who will teach them? You're the only ones that are passionate enough to be here tonight to even expect to reach them. Your colleagues won't. You have to teach them too. And you have to teach them that ICU recovery has to begin the day of ICU admission, not as an afterthought after they leave your ICU and go to your floor where you know they're not going to eat the bad hospital food, and we know they're not getting anything they need then. We need to change that. And perhaps, as you heard Elizabeth say, we need to be doing this before they come to us. We've started programs like this at Duke as well, where we're treating people before surgery, before cancer care. Elizabeth's way ahead of us. but. If she can do it and I can do it, you can do it. This has to happen before. And this needs to continue long after hospital discharge. Again, six months to two years after hospital discharge. Because if we're going to create survivors of our patients and not victims, getting them out of the ICU is not enough. It's not enough. Winning the battle against sepsis is just a start if we're losing the battle against the quality of life epidemic that our patients are facing. Because if we're not going to fix their life quality issues afterwards, why do we do this at all? Why, what are we saving them for? What are we saving them for? So if we're going to start creating survivors, we need to do better. We need to use these new technologies, and we need to use our knowledge that has existed since 1945 to get our patients what they need. These are unique opportunities we have. And perhaps, of course, we have to exercise our patients. This has to be an essential part of the recovery. It's an essential part of their therapy, just like their antibiotics or any other care they're on in these post-ICU clinics. Of course, in the US, we don't do much exercise, but this is a slide from the UK. I guess in, the, in Europe, there isn't much exercise going on either. So we have to be better. And, and I always am told, well, it's so hard to mobilize patients on ventilators. It's so hard to mobilize patients any time in the hospital. Well, I don't believe that because this patient that I'm going to show you is a patient in rural Brazil in a third, in a small world, government hospital with very little funding. This is a patient doing bed squats on a ventilator in a rural hospital. If they can do it, we can do it. No patient is too sick to exercise unless they're paralyzed or on multiple pressors in shock. And we need to have beds that promote mobility and strength from the moment they hit the ICU that, till long after they leave. These are beds you can do squats in and curls and begin to strengthen the core muscles that allow us to walk, that allow us to walk. And so I think as we close tonight, now we need you to realize we have to take responsibility for our outcomes, not just in the ICU, but well after, that we have to be thinking about from the day they're admitted, will they walk down the street again with the people they love? And what do we need to do to get them there? And of course, that includes nutrition, rehabilitation, and many other things. But perhaps we can learn from people like this how to do a little more than just eat right, but also how to eat right. Learn from people like this how to measure what we do and actually see if our nutrition is helping our patients. And take patients that look like this, get them to a place where they look like this, perhaps even like this, and then ultimately like this, or at least like this. And so with that, 
We look forward to your questions. Thank you.